I would like to welcome all of our viewers to another edition of Islam Universal System. I am your host and commentator, Ibrahim Abdus Samad. On today's program, I am happy to have with me one of the pioneers in the contemporary Muslim community. For many years, many years, this brother has given much service in the area of Dawah, particularly concerning the study of comparative religion. He has, he has debated numerous Christian clergy while explaining the Islamic concept of the previous books, scriptures, and the divinity of Isa ibn Maryam being Jesus Christ the son of Mary. Alhamdulillah, let me introduce to you Brother Hamza Abdul Malik. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa Welcome to Islam Universal Alhamdulillah system. and jazakallah khair for having me here. Alhamdulillah. Okay, I guess the best place to start, Hamza, <coughs> is to ask how you came to know of Islam and when you took shahada. Alhamdulillah. Uh, I was introduced to Islam by a friend of a friend of mine. Okay. Uh, a brother who uh, I knew and I met him back in uh, 1970. I had met, met him before then, but in 1970, he introduced me to Islam by inviting me to a Muslim gathering, which mm. at the time I thought was like a party. <laughs> so I thought I was going to a party. Mm -hmm. And so I got dressed thinking that I'm going to a party. And I came to Brooklyn and I went to this uh, location. Uh, and when I walked in the door, it was like I had stepped into the twilight zone, mm. like I had walked into another world. Uh, I came in with a big hat on and dressed like uh, one of the guys out of Superfly. Right. And I saw all of these people in here that had on loose-fitting clothing, modest dress, uh, women and children uh, running around, quiet atmosphere. Uh, they were serving juices. There was no liquor, mm. no bars. Uh, there was no dancing, no music playing of that nature. Mm. And so I was taken uh, aback by that. Mm. and I stood there feeling out of place. Mm. However, as I began to browse around, I saw some of the literature, and I found a piece of literature that dealt with a life after death. Mm. And that was fascinating to me because I had never really thought about life after death. I was a young man, 27 years old, and it didn't dawn on me at the time that there's a life after death. Mm. So as I began to just ponder that and look through that booklet, I was introduced to several other brothers by this friend, Hmm. And another thing that caught me was I met a brother who was known as Bilal. And they used to call him Big Bilal, you no. know him. And uh, he was a very big brother, giant of a brother, but just the opposite of that. He was a very meek and mild, humble, humble brother. Yes. And at the time, I always had thought of big, brawny guys as bullies. Right. You know? <laughs> and so to see a guy so humble, I had thought what was making him so humble. Hmm. And his speech was so humble. And as we sat and we began to talk during the course of that evening, uh, and they began to discuss with me about things about Islam and so forth, and I was given my views about God and things. I had been raised as a Christian. Right. And uh, they convinced me through their arguments and their reasoning that Islam was the way of life ordained for mankind. I had really no, no argument against the things that they were saying about the oneness of God and so forth. And so I accepted Islam that evening, 1972. 1970, I'm sorry. SubhanAllah, that's very enlightening, alhamdulillah. One year later, by the way, I was uh, in Mecca, Mecca and Hajj. SubhanAllah, alhamdulillah, Allah Akbar. Okay, um, after you accepted Islam, you mm -hmm. became a Muslim, and obviously from moving from accepting Shahada one year to Hajj the next year, yeah. obviously you're a very active Muslim. What 
turned you in the direction to study comparative religion? Okay. Well, again, being active, as you said, uh, I had been trying to, con to convey uh, this new religion that I had adopted this right. for myself, Islam, to my relatives. And uh, it was strange to them. They, I had changed my name at the time. Most of us. And yeah. uh, stopped eating pork and stopped uh, yeah. all of the vices and no. things that I had been doing. And they looked at me as like, well, what's gotten into him? <laughs> and as I began to try to tell them about Islam, it was falling like on deaf ears. They right. couldn't relate to it. I didn't know that much about it myself at the time, but eager to tell them about it, right. I was doing the best I could. And uh, this idea of Jesus, peace be upon him, and Please. his being the son of God and God right. and dying for the sins and the savior of the world and all that was constantly in their argument. And so as I began to study and learn about Islam, I knew that many of those things, I came to know that many of those doctrines and teachings of Christianity were uh, against the teachings of Islam. Right. So I had to begin to compare those uh, uh, various doctrines, right. and that's what I, I did. I started doing that. And I met a brother who had a bookstore who uh, uh, took me in and began to tutor me a little bit. Do we know him? Uh, his name was, was Jamal. Oh, Jamal, yeah. He used Jamal. to have the bookstore in Brooklyn. No, nah, no. Nah, yeah, I and uh, I went to his house, and I had never seen so many books in a person's house in my life. Nah. And that got me motivated to begin to collect books and uh, begin to study. And right. I started studying, reading everything I could get my hands on right. as it related to uh, uh, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Subhanallah. Okay, <clears throat> I understand that you met and... Um, interacted with uh, Sheikh Ahmed Didat. Could yeah. you tell us a little bit about how you came to, you know, meet him and interact with him? Yes. Uh, as I was studying uh, comparative religion, he, he at the time was and is known world widely as a Definitely. scholar of comparative religion. Exactly. And uh, I had began to listen. I had ran into someone who had a few of his tapes. Right. And I got a few of his tapes, audio cassettes at the time, and I began to listen to his tapes and listen to the way that he formatted his arguments and the way that he documented them from biblical sources, right. Quranic sources, mm. or whatever sources that he was arguing from. Mm. And I thought the methodology was unique and ideal, and it suited me. It suited what I wanted to do. Mm. I had been reading those kind of things and arguments like that, but I had never come in contact with anyone who had been articulating them right. in person or on any kind of a audio, uh, cassette or anything. Right. So I got those tapes and I began to listen to them. And then I uh, got to meet him in 1977 when mm -hmm. he first made his uh, trip to the United States right. at Columbia University. So I mm -hmm. met him there in person. Mm -hmm. And when I came there and met him, such a giant of a person also, and a very mild and, and a soft-spoken guy, but determined in his right. his position. Right. Uh, that let me know right then that this is what I wanted to do. Alhamdulillah. Um, I understand that uh, prior to your meeting him, you um, you kind of did a lot of study on your own. Yeah. So when you met him, it wasn't more exactly as a teacher student. It was more like you uh, came ready, so to speak, yeah. to you exactly. know begin that path. Exactly. And today, a lot of people consider me a student of Sheikh Didat, Ahmed mm -hmm. Didat. Uh, I say, no, I'm not a student. If you ask him, mm -hmm. he'll say, no, I'm a student of Brother Hamza. <laughs> and if you right. ask me, what's the student? So student, I say, no, I'm a student of the style of mm -hmm. Sheikh Didat. Oh, okay. I adopted his style. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. <laughs> and that's what we need, brother. We need... Right. And I did, I'm sorry, I mm -hmm. did benefit from, uh, in my early days of studying, from right. from the work that he did. I don't want to, that to be misunderstood. Right, exactly. But no, I'm not mimicking uh, in my presentation of my positions and my arguments in the I same understand. vein, uh, the same thing that Sheikh Didat has uh, mentioned. I think I have and he would agree uh, that I've taken it on another level. Alhamdulillah. Well, obviously, I understand that you have recently given something of a promotion to the head of the American branch of the Islamic Propagation Center International. Yes. How did that come about? Well, I had founded all, also previously my own organization, uh, okay. which was known as Islamic Research and Propagation Center. Okay. And uh, we had been doing that for some years. Hmm. And that entailed a group of brothers and some sisters uh, researching and critiquing not only uh, 
other religions, but Islam as well. Right. Going over our own belief and practices right. to make sure that we had those documentary uh, yeah, evidence. Exactly. And uh, I, uh, I had been doing that, and then uh, the question was, I forgot the... The question was, how did, uh, you, are, you are now head of the American... Oh, how did I get appointed then, right. yes. And uh, so, uh, brother, I met a brother named, his name is Akil Khan. He's a very mm -hmm. good brother, very good friend of mine now. Mm -hmm. He's uh, the head of a um, counting firm known as Santa Tax. Mm -hmm. And he was a, a friend of Sheikh Didat's. Mm -hmm. And they were in communication, and uh, uh, I met him. And he admired the work that I was doing on this right. end of town, and he saw the resemblance to the work that Sheikh Didat was doing. Mm. And so he thought that I should un unite my efforts with right. the efforts that he, as well as the brothers in Durban, was doing, right. rather than have a separate entity. Right, have uh, it and collectively. They didn't have anybody who could really articulate mm -hmm. the position uh, uh, that Didat was taking here. I mean, mm -hmm. they were distributing tapes and pamphlets and booklets and stuff, right. but they didn't have a mouthpiece. Right. So they said, well, look, brother, you're doing pretty much the same kind of work. We're uh -huh. in need of somebody to head up the organization here. Right. So why don't you just come on and be the president of this organization? So I accepted. Alhamdulillah. Because his organization is well known, uh -huh. and uh, I thought it would be better just to further that cause. Alhamdulillah. Okay, um, what are your immediate plans for the organization, yes. Islamic Propagation Center International? Well, right now we just uh, unveiled uh, last two weeks ago at Masjid al-Fatima something called a mobile dawah unit. Mm. And this is like a uh, mobile Islamic center an Islamic center that you can take from community to community. Hmm. You know, a lot of people I have observed uh, are a little bit shy, uh, non-Muslims, about right. coming into uh, massages, mosques, right. and Islamic centers and so forth because of sometimes it's the dress code or right. other things that make them a little leery. And so, therefore, they don't get a chance to step in to see that. I'm sorry. Hold on one second. Hold that thought, brother. Okay. Inshallah, we'll be right back. Ya Nabi Salaam Alaika Ya Rasul Salaam Alaika Salaam Alaika Ya Rasul Salaam Alaika Ya Habib Salaam Alaika Salawatullah Alaika Alhamdulillah, welcome back. Let us continue with our discussion with Brother Hamza Abdul Malik from the Islamic Propagation Center International. Brother Hamza, before we went to the break, you were explaining about um, the immediate plans for the organization. You said you had something like a dower package. Yes, we have a mobile dower unit, right. which is a van that's equipped with a VCR TV with a table for literature. We can give right. out free literature, and we have literature for sale. Mm -hmm. We have uh, signs there with questions on it that prompt people to ask and to ponder and to think mm -hmm. and so therefore we can take that unit from community to community and so it should be showing up like that Channel 7 van and <laughs> that <neighborhood>, so. <laughs> SubhanAllah, Alhamdulillah, that's a very good program. Okay, what are your long-term plans for your organization? We intend to acquire a piece of real estate property, a property, a building mm -hmm. that we could house a uh, Islamic uh, Dawa Center that we could train students professionally to uh, give Dawa invitation, invite people to Islam, and also to have an in-house studio similar to what we have here uh, that we can create our own programs, mm. video and television programs, right. and uh, also to house people who uh, don't have place to live, to feed people who don't have food to Ooh. eat, to oh, clothes yeah. people who don't have clothes to wear, all those kind of things we want to do. Uh, community oriented uh, mm. uh, service uh, operation. So in other words, you're going to have, you're going to give Dawa yeah. as well as help the people help the on people a, as well. a fundamental level, exactly. homeless, the there hungry. You go. That's it. May Allah reward you, brother, because this is indeed things that we definitely Amin. need. Alhamdulillah. Another thing, I understand that you recently wrapped a debate with a Christian minister in Texas. Mm. Could you give some particulars of, you know, how it went? And yes. Well, this is the second trip that we made to Texas for a debate. Mm -hmm. uh, prior to that, we had what is known as the marathon debate in the church for five days Ooh. and five topics. Mm. And so one of the gentlemen that I debated recently was at that debate, and he's affiliated with the church. And so he thought he'd take a stab at it as well. So he invited us to a, a debate. So this was in Arlington, Texas. The gentleman's name is Doc, Dr. Jack Evans. Mm. And 
uh, he's the head of a Christian college there. And mm -hmm. so we debated, debated two propositions. One, okay. does the Bible foretell the advent of Muhammad, peace mm -hmm. be upon him, mm -hmm. and is Jesus Christ God, the Son, or uh, the Son of God? Okay. So those two propositions we argued. I uh, argued proposition number one, that Muhammad is foretold. He negated it, attempted to. And then he argued, is Jesus Christ God? Mm. And I attempted to negate that. Mm. And I think you have a clip of that here, if uh, you like. You can yeah, inshallah. Mm. All right, let's take a look at that and see, yeah. inshallah, so. how that turned out. Mm -hmm. That Muhammad was not mentioned in the Bible. I never said that Muhammad, peace be upon him, Salaam was not mentioned in the Bible. First of all, the proposition that I was given does not mandate that I show the name Muhammad in the Bible. However, I have the name of Muhammad here in the Bible. And let's see if I can get it. Dr. Evans. It was the Bible. No, no. Psalms, I mean, uh, Psalms chapter 5, verse 16. See if you can find that scripture. Solomon 5.16, where the Hebrew word is Muhammadin. Muhammadin. Now, he says the name. Look at this strange thing. In Isaiah 7.14, it says, Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a child shall call his name Emmanuel. What does Emmanuel mean? They tell you. It means God with us. But now in Solomon 5.16, for some reason, they don't translate, they don't give the name. They give the meaning of the name. How is it that you give a person's name is there and you don't translate the name, you don't put the name in the text, you give the meaning of the name. I have the Hebrew here. It should be in one of my notes here. Okay, my time is up. I'll dig that up and I'll present it to Dr. Evans in a few minutes. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Malik. You, you want to know if you needed a warning before your 15 minutes were up? Yes, five minutes. Mr. Malik uh, ran out of time, but it was appropriate. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't have enough time to, f to find Mohammed in Song of Solomon 516. I mentioned that earlier. There, it says, my beloved is altogether lovely. Now, verse 10 says, my beloved is white. The reason I'm quoting that, and then in 1-5 Song of Solomon, Solomon said, I am black. Now, what is he saying? He's using symbolism. This is poetic symbolism. And altogether lovely does not mean Mohammed. Now, here's, here's, here's an interlinear Bible, Hebrew, Greek, and English, and I want him to find Muhammad in Hebrew in this Bible. Here it is right here. Now, when he comes back, just ask him to find Muhammad's name in Hebrew uh, in that Bible. All right, that's it. <laughs> Okay, let's move on. Short time this time. Uh, he asked about Muhammad in the Bible, and he gave me a Bible to find it, so I found it for him. It's in the Hebrew. I told him the word is in the Hebrew, and I, give him, I gave him a paper with the Hebrew and the phonetics to help him to learn to read this now. Here, I'll read you the phonetics. Solomon 5.16. Hiku Mamitakim, Vikuli Muhammadin, Zidudi. This, this Muhammadim, Muhammad, the same birds, uh, Mim Ha, Mim Del, is the same Hebrew of, uh, of verbs. And this word is Muhammad. I've asked already Orthodox Jews who know. I've asked him, just for curiosity, what does it mean? He's quibbling, he sees the possibility, but he's got something else. So now he says, I'm saying to him now, to D Dr. Evans, that instead of translating the word up front, 
Muhammad, and then saying next to it, meaning he's altogether lovely. He's altogether lovely, you know? You know, when, when a foreign language and, and a foreign language is used in one of your translations, like in the Bible where it says, Eloi, Eloi, Lama Shabbatani, my God, my God, why has thou forsaken me? It's translated right there so you can see. When it says Emmanuel, it's translated. When it says Talitha Kumi, it says translated. When it says Abba, it's translated. Because you don't know those words. So why did they not translate Muhammad? Muhammad then say he's altogether lovely. It's there, right there. Now you take it to your Jewish scholar. Alhamdulillah, Brother Hamza, those are some pretty powerful evidences. Yeah, well. Alhamdulillah, moving right along. <clears throat> what was the response of the Muslim community in terms of attendance at this particular debate? Overall, there was about uh, 1,200 people who came out to this uh, event. This was held in a church, right. and uh, the Muslims had very, very good response. As a matter of fact, they were elated. Mm. Uh, they enjoyed the presentation, and they thought that uh, it was uh, well uh, presented. Alhamdulillah. Um, I understand that you are presently giving lectures in, on comparative religion in the uh, metropolitan area? Yes. Uh, those uh, lectures and classes are being held at Masjid Al Fatima, mm -hmm. uh, Woodside, Queens, New York, 58th right. Street, 37th Avenue. Mm -hmm. And it's an ongoing series of lectures. Prior to that, we had been given, like, every three months we give lectures, and we have some of those uh, videotaped. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. So anyone who would wish to get them, we have them. We can present it as a package oh. to different messages and so forth. Okay. But it's every Friday night from 7 to 9 p.m., mm -hmm. and we have a range of topics that we discuss. Oh. Speaking of a range of, t uh, of topics, um, could you give us some brief, just a brief, you know, rundown on the following? Uh, is Jesus the Son of God? What is the, you know, what is the strongest evidence that you would present to refute that argument? Well, first of all, the term Son of God is, uh, is a term that's used uh, uh, without uh, uh, proper usage okay. uh, by Christians. Hmm. Uh, the term should be, uh, in their theology, God the Son. Right. Uh, their Trinitarian doctrine is that Jesus is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. Right. Now, Son of God is a term that's used in the Bible, both Old and New Testaments, to mean a righteous person. Right. Any righteous person, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called children of God. Mm -hmm. God said that Israel was my son, even my, even my firstborn. Uh, David is my son, even my firstborn. Mm -hmm. So son of God is just a term that you, to use as a righteous man. Now, Jesus right. certified that himself mm -hmm. uh, in one place where uh, he pointed to himself by saying that, is it not written in your law in Psalms 82, 6? I say, ye are gods. If he called them gods, then it's no problem using the term son of God in that allegorical, metaphorical sense. Okay. I don't have time to get into it. Maybe okay. at another time we can deal with more deeply. One other uh, question on that. Uh, the Bible used the term son of man. How yeah. is that to be? Son of man is used just to mean any ordinary man. And this is basically the way Jesus addressed himself. Mm. Out of 100% of the times that Jesus used the uh, terms about himself, uh, at least 80% of the time he used son of man. It means mm. an ordinary man. A mortal oh, wow. human being. Very interesting, yeah. Paula. Okay, um, what tests can be applied to determine if the Bible is, the, as a whole, is the authentic Word of God? Well, the basic test that should be applied, and the same test that is applied to the Quran, yeah. is that it does not contain inconsistencies, contradictions, right. blatantly outright contradictions. Right. And so that is the test that should be applied, hmm. and that is the test that we apply. Alhamdulillah. Unfortunately, it doesn't meet the test. Right, uh, exactly, <laughs> Sipala. Okay, another question. The mission of Jesus. Mm -hmm. To whom was he and his apostles sent? Well, Jesus himself proclaimed that he was sent only to uh, the Israelite people. In I Matthew 15, 24, yeah. right. Matthew 15, 24, there it says, I am not sent but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Mm. And Jesus never retracted that statement. Mm. And when he commissioned... Uh, which is falsely termed the Great Commission, okay. is actually the Limited Commission. In Matthew 10, 5, 6, he said, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, any city of the Samaritans, enter ye not, but go ye rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Mm. And so, therefore, he commissioned his disciples uh, only to the uh, house of Israel. Mm. Okay, so in essence, then, what we people call today Pauline Christianity is actually a deviant version of his message or goes away from his message. In other words, Paul says he was inspired by Jesus to do this and do that, but 
you know, what, what is... Uh, In reality, Christianity is not a religion of Jesus. Right. It's a religion about Jesus. Okay. It's uh, something that has been established by uh, Paul, basically. Right. Established. He didn't found it, mm -hmm. many of the doctrines. He didn't right. found the doctrine of Trinity or the doctrine of, uh, of uh, uh, Jesus being God. Right. But he founded many of the other doctrines that salvation is through grace and so forth. Oh. should be called Paulinism. Right, right. Because I, I know some Muslim yeah. scholars have used that term Pauline. They call yeah. it Pauline Christianity. Yeah. Okay, another question. Was Jesus killed or crucified? Uh, Jesus was not killed nor crucified, and the Quran makes that mm -hmm. very clear. Yes. And so, uh, from a Quran, from an Islamic perspective, we know that for sure. However, the the Bible itself certifies that position uh -huh. that Jesus was not killed or crucified. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, do any of the biblical books foretell the coming and the revelation, the coming of Muhammad and the revelation of the Quran? Yes, uh, the Bible, as what you just saw mm -hmm. from that uh, clip that we just had, foretells the uh, advent of Muhammad. Although we don't adhere to the Bible as a whole as being right. the unadulterated Word of God, but there are some truth in the Bible, and those truths certify the basic truths that Islam teaches. Alhamdulillah. Okay, brother, we have to wrap up now. Mm -hmm. And Alhamdulillah, it was uh, good having you here, sure. and we hope to have you back. Uh, could you give uh, our audience some information on... Uh, how to contact you or uh, where your organization is at located Islamic Propagation Center International? Okay, we're the Islamic Propagation Center International, uh, P.O. Box 200808, uh, South Ozone Park, uh, Queens, New York, area code 11420. Telephone number, area code 718-721-4000. Uh, um, uh, Okay, uh, this program's number is IUS 98101. Our email address is IUSTV at AOL.com. Until next time, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Ya Habib, salam alayka, salawatullah alayka. Ya Nabi, salam alayka, ya Rasul, salam alayka. Ya Habib, salam alayka, salawatullah alayka. Ya Nabi, salam alayka. A'udhu billahi min shaitan ar-rajim, bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين إهدنا الصراط المستقيم الصراط الذين أنمت عليهم كرم مكذوب عليهم ولا ضالين آمين الحمد لله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته I would like to welcome all of our viewers to another edition of Islam the Universal System on this program again we have with us Hamza Abdul Malik and we want to continue our talk on the issues of comparative religion and is Esau the son of God and related issues to comparative religion. Brother Hamza, welcome back. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. for having me here. Shukran, alhamdulillah. Okay, I'm, we might as well jump right into it. Uh, in our previous program, we touched on the question, is the Bible the word of God? And you gave some arguments against it. Now, that's a pretty powerful statement. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure people would want some uh, evidence for it. Could you expound a little further? Okay. Uh, as you recall, in the last, and you just stated, uh, the last show, I did make some statements. And I'm sure the people who seen that, that uh, <laughs> the hair stood up on their heads. So there were, as you said, some very powerful statements. And so now, let's, as you say, try to show up some of those positions. The Bible. We as Muslims follow the Quran as the last and final revelation to all of mankind, right. unadulterated. Mm -hmm. uh, we believe in all the scriptures that came prior to that, uh, including the Torah and the Injil and the Zabur, so forth, the Psalms of David. Right. However, we don't believe that the Bible as it's now uh, presented, right. any of the versions, King James or whatever version you have, right. as a whole, is that word of God intact. 
mm. unadulterated. Okay. However, we believe that portions of it contain those oral traditions that were related right. and transcribed in, in the, uh, into those books. Right. And so that therefore the mechanism, the test that we use right. to uh, uh, ascertain that is does that Bible, uh, does any portions of those books contain contradictions? Mm. Contradiction means to speak against. Right. The word contradict means to speak against. And it's, I have a booklet here from uh, one of our Jehovah Witnesses friends uh, entitled, Is the Bible Really the Word of God? And in it, they asked the question. They said, does the Bible contradict itself? Mm. And I just, more or less, uh, tell you what it says. Okay. It says that many people will say, uh, yes. And then they ask the question, has anyone ever opened the Bible to show you a contradiction? They say that many people who say that the Bible contradicts itself really make no attempt to prove it. Mm -hmm. They are only parroting what they have heard other people say. Okay. So I say, well, look, let's take a look at the Bible, mm -hmm. uh, at the text. Right. When I say text, I don't mean the English or any translation or interpretation, but the actual text of mm. that book. Oh, if it's wow. written in Greek, let's oh. go look at the Greek text right. to see where that problem is, if there's any. So one of the problems about the Bible is uh, very subtle, but it's in the book of Mark and in the book of Matthew. And it, it involves the... Uh, time when Jesus, peace be upon him, was being baptized. Okay. And at the time he was being baptized, it says that a voice came from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Right. Now, another writer comes along and says, no, the voice says, thou art my beloved son in, in whom I'm well pleased. Now, that doesn't sound like much, much of an issue. Right. This is thou art. Right. But when you realize that that only happened one time, that Jesus was baptized one time, and that that voice that came from heaven came one time, and it could only have been one of those two Greek terms. Right. This or thou, it couldn't be both. Exactly. So now, <clears throat> I have before me a uh, transliteration and a, 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 a Greek word there from that text in the book of Mark, chapter one, verse 11. And there it says, you are my son. Thou art my son, and the Greek word is su, mm. S-U. And there it is addressing Jesus, peace be upon him. Now, mind you, Jesus is about 30 years old at the time. Right. And so, therefore, he's being told for the first time in his life that he is God's son. This is known as adoptionist theology, that mm. Jesus is being adopted the son of God, that he's not literally the son of God, right. according to Mark's gospel, and he's the first gospel writer. Mm. He had no knowledge of any concepts of virgin birth. Being a student of Paul, a follower of Paul, right. uh, he uh, had known Paul's teaching about this issue. Talking about Mark. Now. Mark, yeah. Right. Uh, I mean, of Peter, rather. Oh, okay. And so, when Matthew writes on this same issue, about when Jesus was being baptized, somehow or another he disagrees with the use of that term. So I have it right here, and there he changes the term from Sue, you are my beloved son, right. to Haltos, this is my beloved son. Hmm. He's no longer talking to Jesus now, the voice, is talking about <laughs> Jesus right. to someone else. Mm. Why? Because Jesus should know who he is already. Right. The other people don't know, so tell them. So I'm asking now, which one of these texts is correct? Mm. Talking to Jesus, nobody else heard it, or talking about Jesus to someone else, informing them. And there's a whole story behind why this was done. Mm. I don't know if we have time to get into that, mm. but they, we want to show the mind of the individual that someone deliberately made changes here because of their school of thought. Mm. because of some infighting. Put it this way, as I said before, Mark had a doctrine of, uh, known as adoptionist theology, that Jesus right. was not literally the Son of God. Right. He was only adopted Son of God, uh, being the Messiah, being a righteous person. Mm -hmm. As I said before, Israel is the Son of God, right. David is the Son of God, uh, peacemakers are the Son of God, right. anyone who is uh, led by the Spirit of God is sons of God. Right. So Matthew, because he has in his book taken from Isaiah 714, this concept of parthenogenesis or parthenos, uh, there that um, uh, Isaiah pro pro prophesied a virgin to conceive and bear a son. And so because the King James writers used the Greek version of the Hebrew scriptures to 
translate into uh, their uh, uh, versions, they chose the word Parthenos, which in Hebrew is not the right word. The word is uh, Alma. Hmm. Alma. Had it been virgin proper in Hebrew, right. the Hebrew word would have been Bethula. Hmm. So that was a problem. So to support his doctrine uh, of that Jesus was fulfilling that prophecy, he chose to change those terms around, or whoever wrote that, mm. and so that was a problem there. And it stands right there in the text. Mm. So I normally present that to biblical scholars, and they're not able to deal with this. They're not mm. able to refute it. It's right there in uh, Hebrew. That's a problem. That's a contradiction. So in actuality, what you're saying is from there is enough uh, documentary evidence that if a person were to challenge or to accept the Quran's version where Allah says yeah. that uh, different uh, groups change the scripture, yeah. this is the actual documentation. You can go and for see it, it. yeah. Subhan As a matter of fact, in one of the writers in the Bible, in uh, Isaiah chapter uh, 8, verse 8, okay. he says it himself. Mm. He says that, how can you say that we are wise in the law of the Lord, meaning the Torah, is with us? When behold, look, the false pen of the scribes who take the oral tradition mm. and reduce it to write and have made it into a lie. Oh, wow. And uh, just to show you another point, okay. here, and you'll find again in Mark, Mark chapter 1, verse 32, okay. uh, there was an incident where Jesus was passing through a town, and there were some people that needed to be healed, and so they said, well, we'll bring all the people out that Jesus will heal them. So I normally ask the biblical scholar when I'm dealing with on this issue. Right. I says, when Jesus brought all the people out, it says they brought all and he healed many. So the Greek words used there is pantas, all, and he healed many, polus. Okay. Pantas, all, he healed many, polus. I said, how many is all? So they said, well, 20. I said, so how many did he heal? I said, many. He said, maybe 18. So we go on to talk about why he didn't get the other ones healed. However, when Matthew writes about the same incident, he doesn't want to show that Jesus was deficient in his ability to heal. Mm. So what does he do, the writers there? They switch those words around. Okay. Instead of saying they brought uh, all and he healed many, they right. switch the word and say they brought all, it, they brought many, and he, and healed, he healed, healed them all. Supposedly. So the word pantas uh -huh. has been moved down to the bottom and polus at the top. They brought many, he healed all. Here they brought all, he healed many. Mm. Here they brought many, he healed all. Mm. How many did they bring? 20. How many did he healed all? Mm. How many did he bring? 20. How many he healed? 18. <laughs> so I'm saying who switched those words around? Right. right. You see? Mm. And many other incidents. Just to get, give you an example, mm -hmm. uh, when it talks about Judas right. betraying Jesus, Everyone knows that Judas betrayed Jesus with a kiss. Mm. However, that's not supported by all four doc gospel writers. Mm. Two writers said Jesus was portrayed with a kiss. Two said Ju Judas never kissed him at all. Mm. Never oh. kissed him at all. Mm. When it talks about the uh, stone that was at the tomb when Jesus uh, rose from the dead allegedly and came right. out, that when he came out, the tomb was in place, and he came through the tomb, mm. through the stones. And other writers said, no, the stone had to be removed. What was the purpose for that? Some writers believe that Jesus rose as a spirit. Some believe that he rose physically. Mm. If he rose physically, he had to move the stone. If he rose as a spirit, he came through it. Right. So you have a problem there in those uh, books mm. in regards to that. So and many other such things. So these contradictions clearly show in the way that they were translated and they were intentionally I guess you could say moved around yeah, in for whatever yeah. ends, yeah. you know. Because someone certain. wants to support their own position. Right. Don't yeah. forget, just because a scripture there has John, according to John, Matthew, Mark, and all that, right. there was no uh, laws at the time to keep people from uh, inserting their own uh, views in those texts. Right. So this was done many times. Mm. I mean, I can show a slew of that. And we debate this with, with uh, scholars who mm. know the Bible very well. Mm. And we have those debates on tape. So when you have those debates, uh, they they present no answers. They <laughs> well, <laughs> not they to the uh, not to the items I present. Okay. I mean, there's many other discrepancies, as they like to call them, right. that I don't bother with because right. I don't really see any meaning in them. But okay. these kind of things, they're right there. You can't argue against those. Subhanallah. Yeah. Alhamdulillah. Very very enlightening, my brother. Okay. Um, Paul versus Jesus. Yeah. 
Okay, as, as we mentioned in the previous program, something about the Pauline doctrine was substituted. Yeah. Could you go into that? Uh, yeah. You see, Jesus, peace be upon him, came and upheld the Mosaic Code of Law. Right. And in there in the book of Matthew, chapter 5, verse 17, Jesus says there clearly that he did not come to uh, destroy the law of the prophets, to change them, only to fulfill them, to bring them right. uh, fuller to perfection. Mm -hmm. And he announced one that would come after him that would perfect the law. So, however, he didn't change the law. He didn't change the law, the law of circumcision. He didn't right. change the law of earning your salvation, mm. that you had to earn salvation. Right. To he work, to, that. to yeah, deeds. Right. Right. However, Paul comes along with not having ever met Jesus physically. Mm -hmm. He claimed that he had a vision about him, right. and that's contradicted many times in Acts 9, 22, and 26. Mm. However, he claims that vision, and so he made it clear to his adherers that he was only interested in the resurrected Jesus. Mm. He's not interested in historical Jesus and what oh, he did and okay. said. And so Jesus had warned that anyone who teach against those commandments will be called least in the kingdom of God. Mm. Now, as opposed to salvation being earned, mm -hmm. Paul taught a doctrine of salvation through grace. Jesus mm. never used these terms in his life. Mm. That, you, that your salvation now, that all you had to do was believe that Jesus died for your sins, and uh, that you had that faith in that, confess Jesus with your tongue, and right. believe in your heart that he died for your sins, you shall be saved. Salvation is a free gift based on your faith. Mm. Jesus never taught that. He said, except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees. In no case could you enter the kingdom of heaven. Okay, so we're, we're going to go to a clip, but before that, so in essence what you're saying is, is that the message of Jesus is the same message of the Quran in the sense that exactly. um, belief has two ends to it. It yes. has the belief itself and yes. then obeying the Good sacred works. law. Well, yeah, right. faith and works. Right. Faith and works. And, uh, you know, Jesus was a Muslim anyway. Alhamdulillah. Yeah, a Muslim, exactly. one who submitted to the will of God. And Jesus said that. He said, I only came to do the will of my Father who sent me. Alhamdulillah. The will of my Father. The prayer that he taught. Our right. Father who art in heaven, hallowed, hallowed be thy, thy name. name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will, he wants to be done. As is being done in heaven already. Yeah. So doing the will of God is Islam. And the one who does it is a Muslim. That's very interesting because uh, religious scholars say the same religion in, in heaven is the same religion on earth. Exactly. The Islam. same religion of creation. No. Submission to the will of God. Jesus never taught Christianity. He never heard the term Christianity. never yeah. heard the term Christ. No. Okay, brother. Yeah. Alhamdulillah. Very, very insightful. Yeah. Uh, we have to go to a video clip now? Now, this clip, yeah, uh, is oh. about, it deals with uh, the, one of the debates that we had right. in reference to Jesus being God. Mm -hmm. And there I pointed out something that was very unique to show that Jesus was not God and kind of hushed the audience up. So <laughs> take a look at it. SubhanAllah. <laughs> Addressing uh, the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 23, Paul says, that ye belong to Christ and Christ belong to God. Ye are Christ and Christ is God's. You belong to Christ, Christ belongs to God. Now, in case that's not simple enough, he says, well, look, and it's a little complicated. Let me make it a little simple of what I just said. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3, here's what Paul says. Now, I want this understood too. Very simple. He says, look, I would have you to know that the head of every, uh, the head of, uh, of, of the woman, every, uh, the head of every man is Christ. The head of every man is Christ. And the head of every woman is the man. And the head of Christ is God. Look at that. The head of every man is Christ. And the head of the woman is the man. And the head of Christ is God. He's the head of Christ. Mighty quiet in here. Got to get some amens on that. This is the Bible I'm quoting. I know. This is kind of hard to digest, but it's just like anything else, you know. You go in for sickness and major operation. You dread going to under the needle, under the knife, but once it's over, you feel much better, so. Tomorrow, <laughs> tomorrow you'll feel better. <laughs> First, Alhamdulillah, Allahu Akbar. Yeah. Um, that was very interesting, brother. Yeah. Um, okay, so what you were saying with regard to um, the actual, um, uh, let's go back to Paul versus Jesus. Mm -hmm. um, tell us a little bit more about him. Uh, what you know. 
Okay, so, Paul, uh, again, had never met Jesus, mm -hmm. and he had somewhat apostatized mm -hmm. from his own uh, faith. Okay. He was a Pharisee Jew, a strict follower of the Jewish law. Right. And he was disturbed about the ritual, uh, the rigidness of the law. Right. Practicing doing one thing after the other. Mm. And so he didn't like that, and he left it. Mm. And he tried to, uh, once he, he was, before he was known as Paul, he was called Saul of Tarsus. Mm. And he was like a bounty hunter. He would go out looking for the people that was following Jesus. He had heard right. about this uh, uh, group, these people following the, the Christ, the Messiah, mm -hmm. and he didn't believe that that situation was correct. So he was getting petitions from different uh, synagogues to go out and look for these people and bring them in, dead or alive. Mm. And so one day, while he claims that he was on the road headed to Damascus to get a group of people, he had this uh, vision that he had seen Jesus, mm. peace be upon him, and so that therefore he got converted. And as he got converted, now he went back, uh, he hooked up with some uh, uh, other followers of Jesus, Barnabas okay. by name, and he went back, Barnabas took him back to Jerusalem to introduce him to some of these uh, disciples of Jesus, James and John and Peter and some other people. Mm. And so he spent about a year trying to convince them uh, that they should let go of the law, that they should not be so rigid in their doctrines and so forth. Mm. And they themselves had him go into the synagogue and purify himself mm. to take an oath that he would decease from that kind of a uh, mm. discussion. And oh. eventually he just gave up on them and just turned to the Gentile world, mm. where Jesus had said not to go to the Gentile. He proclaimed himself, right. uh, uh, being guided by Jesus, to go to the Gentiles. Hmm. And just the opposite of that, you know, Peter had claimed himself that he was sent to the Gentiles. And so him, him and Paul had a dispute about who was sent to the Gentiles. Hmm. And both of them would be sounding silly if, in fact, what the Christians tell us, the Great Commission in Matthew 28, 19, hmm. where Jesus told all of his disciples right. that you all commissioned to the Gentiles, go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. Hmm. So there would be no need for Paul to be unique in doing that. Right. They were all to do that. There would be no need for G Peter to claim that for himself. They were all to do that, hmm. although we know even all of that was c incorrect. Mm. Because, yeah, it, it sounds that way because, as you said, mm. you had mentioned uh, uh, the biblical quotation where Jesus said he was for the children of Israel, yeah. for the house of Israel. So mm -hmm. why would he, you know, contradict himself and then send people into for the Gentiles? They claimed that that was while he was living uh, in the world and after he died and resurrected that all power was given to him. So he, he gave this great commission. However, that's mm. not correct. If you look in Matthew chapter 10, verse 23, after Jesus had told his disciples not to go to the Gentiles or any city of the Samaritans, and then he predicted in Matthew 10, 23, he says, you will not have gone over all the cities of Palestine, of Israel, of Jerusalem, right. until he has returned. Mm. They went out, came back. He never had left, more or less returned. Mm. He hadn't even left. And they covered that ground. So, and so that prophecy uh, showed that Jesus had expected a limited commissioned there, mm -hmm. not to the whole world. They wouldn't have had time to just go to the Israelites, mm. or less the whole world. Mm. And then finally, in uh, Matthew, uh, I normally teach my students that when you look at Matthew 28, 19, okay. the so-called Great Commission, right. just turn it around. Mm. Matthew 19, 28, it just fits like that. Mm. And there, Peter has asked Jesus, peace be upon him, you know, we have followed you and all that. What are we going to get out of this? And he told them that you who have followed me when I sit on my throne, you will sit with me on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. That's all. Mm. Not responsible for anybody else. That's on the day of judgment. Mm. So it couldn't have been any Gentiles involved. So in other words, he's saying uh, from, from his, his teaching, his teaching in this world and in the hereafter, yeah. is only for the children of Israel and no one else. Nobody else. He mm. predicted someone else that would come to guide the rest of humanity. SubhanAllah. Yes. Alhamdulillah. One, other qu uh, one brief question. Uh, you mentioned something about um, uh, Jesus in this world, and you mentioned something about his coming back. Mm -hmm. Is this what the uh, Jews relate to when they say him coming back to reestablish the state of Israel? or uh, Not the state of Israel.
but uh, to, I guess, resurrect the people of Israel or something like well, that? Well, this is, I, I related to that to show that the prophecy mm -hmm. was uh, that the uh, so-called Great Commission right. was only to be limited. Right. Now, there's controversies in the Bible concerning the return of Jesus also. Right. These people are known. Mm. Uh, there's one writer who seems to think that Jesus won't come back. Okay. And that is John. Mm. You know, John in John chapter uh, uh, 14 and 16, uh, where he's prophesying the coming of the Comforter. Right. Uh, Paraclete, I think it is. Paraclete, yeah. Right. And there he says that it's necessary that Jesus should go away. Jesus says himself, right. uh, according to John, it's necessary that I expedient for you that I go away, that I depart from you. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come. But mm. if I go, uh, I will send him. And when he comes, he will abide with you forever, meaning that Jesus and the Comforter cannot be here at the same time. Mm. So now Christian brethren tell us that that Comforter is the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost. Now, if the Holy Ghost is to abide with mankind forever and right. Jesus can't be here while he's here, mm -hmm. that means Jesus can't come back. Okay. This is the logical conclusion. Mm. If Jesus returns, he's going to be here with the Holy Ghost which he just told the people, is, I have to go, he can't come. Right. And when he comes, he'll abide with you forever. So that doctrine there is wrong being taken as the Holy Ghost. Okay. It rejects any return of Jesus coming by. So this actually, uh, in essence, talks about Rasulullah coming, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and that Esau leaving, and that, uh, that, e and that Muhammad the comforter, right. the comforter. Now, there's many comforters that were promised to come, and we don't deny that the Holy Ghost was a comforter, right. but that he, the Spirit of Truth in John's Gospel, is not that Holy Ghost or that return of the one on the day of Pentecost. You see how Christian brethren have gotten two prophecies in the Bible mixed up and confused. Mm, mm. You know, Luke in his Gospel, in Luke chapter 24, verse 49, had made a prophecy, had Jesus make a prophecy that his disciples tarry ye in Israel here, I mean in Jerusalem, mm -hmm. until you be endued with power from on high. So that was the day of Pentecost prophecy that Luke was uh, prophesying mm. that had relationship to the prophecy of Joel also. Mm. However, John, when he comes along and writes, he predicts another one totally different and unique from the Holy Ghost mm. that would come someone that would come not only to hear things right. but repeat those things that he would hear mm. he said when he the spirit of truth would come he will guide you into all truth how for he shall not speak of himself but whatsoever he shall hear that shall he speak mm. so this person has to hear audible sounds right. and articulate audible sounds right. and be told that by someone else we know that can't be the holy ghost exactly. third person of the trinity who is god no one tells god what to say okay so it has to be another person. It has to be another person. And the key, key to that okay. is uh, where John, in his gospel, John chapter 14, speaks of another comforter. And there in the Greek terms, Greek text, the term is allos. Mm. Allos mean another of the same kind. You know, in Greek, when you want another, you use two different words. In English, when you want another, it's one word. Right. If I'm at your house and I'm having strawberry cookies, okay. and I say, oh, that was delicious, can I have another? and you bring me chocolate, and I said, I don't eat chocolate. You said, well, you want another cookie? I meant another of the same kind. Mm. So I have to say another strawberry. I have to define. Oh, okay. But if you want in Greek to say another, mm. if you want the same kind, you say allos. If you want a different kind, you say heteros, mm. where we get the word heterosexual from, oh, opposite. Wow. Mm. So Jesus, what word did he use? Allos. He said mm. another of the same kind, meaning a mortal human being like himself. Mm. And we know that he was a mortal human being because he said that in John chapter 8, verse 40. He told his, uh, the Jews there, he says, now you seek to kill me, a man, anthropos is the Greek term. Right. Anthropos means a mortal, fatal, uh, fallible human being. Right. It was told the truth which I heard from God. Hmm. So he predicted another like him to come. That's a, a lot of information there. Allah 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 Allah. Yes, it is, my brother. Alhamdulillah, it touches in a lot of areas. Yeah. Okay. Um, can you say Christianity, could you define it, being I know you've done much research on it and it's e evident from the information that you've presented, mm -hmm. could you say that Christianity is a cult or, or the Christians have made uh, G Jesus into a cult, so to speak? Yeah, <laughs> well, uh, well, what you said correct, was correct the first time right. and it's, it's very shocking, it's a very shocking and a very hmm. serious statement to make. Hmm. But when you look at the definition of cult, right. what does the definition of cult? Basically it means they a, a deviant movement surrounded as uh, surrounding a charismatic personality mm -hmm. a charismatic personality and a deviant uh, movement mm. so now 
who is that charismatic personality in Christianity? Paul. And who is the deviant movement? The Christians, because they have deviated from the teachings of Jesus, peace be upon him. Mm. What Jesus taught, Jesus never taught that he was God. Jesus in John chapter 17, verse 3, told his disciples, departing from them, he says, this is life eternal, that they may know thee, the only true God, and mm. Jesus Christ, whom thou have sent. He says, now you seek to kill me, a man that has told you the truth, that I heard the true truth from God. Mm. And when he had allegedly rose from the uh, dead and met Mary Magdalene in the garden, mm -hmm. he says, go unto my brethren and say unto them, after he told her, touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my father, but go unto my brethren and say unto them, I ascend to my father and your father, to my God and your God. And this is another point I asked uh, the Re Reverend Doctor on the tape, mm. who is Jesus' God? Okay. Brother, we have to go. We have to wrap this up. Inshallah, it was wonderful having you back again. You provide us with a lot of profound insight and religious information. May Allah reward you and bless you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi Alhamdulillah, that brings this program to a close. This program's number is IUS 981002. Our email number is IUS, email address is IUSTV at AOL.com. Until next time, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Ya Nabi Salam Aleyka Ya Rasul Salam Aleyka Ya Habib Salam Aleyka Salvatullah Aleyka Ya Nabi Salam Aleyka Ya Rasul Salam Aleyka Ya Habib Salam Aleyka Salam Aleyka, Ya Nabi Salam Aleyka, Ya Rasul Salam.